we've been talking over the past several weeks about being rooted and grounded in Christ and the journeys we've taken, the experiences we've had, the places God has led. Today we're going to talk about how did I get here? And I'd like us to begin by reading together a verse, a couple verses from the 116th Psalm. Psalm 116. Mm -hmm. I invite you to read these words aloud with me. Let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. He has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was spring of my senior year in theological seminary. Sally and I had been dating for some time, and I was thinking about a number of things. In a few short months, I would be graduating from seminary. I would be notified of my first appointment in the East Ohio Conference of the Methodist Church. In addition to my upcoming graduation and appointment, I was contemplating asking Sally if she would marry me. I was weighing that heavily. That was a big choice. I was also weighing where I might be appointed. I knew it could be anywhere in the East Ohio Conference, from the Sandusky area to just above Marietta, to anywhere along the Ohio Pennsylvania State Line. And not always having exercised wise judgment in my dating, I realized that the choice of whom I would marry would be one of the most important decisions of my life. And I sought some sort of confirmation from God. I needed some sort of affirmation I was making the right choice. I knew what my heart was telling me, but I wanted to know that my heart had God's blessing. So without telling anyone, I didn't tell Sally, I didn't tell my friends, I laid a fleece before God. You know, you know, you're, you know that imagery? The Old Testament, God appears to Gideon and tells him to do something, and Gideon's not too sure, and so he says, well, Lord, I, I'm going to lay this fleece out, and this is really what you want. In the morning, I want the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. So in the morning, the fleece is wet and the ground is dry. And then Josh, or Gideon, like many of us, says, uh, okay, uh, tomorrow morning, I want the fleece to be dry and the ground to be wet. And God puts up with his anxieties and does that. I kind of laid a fleece out. There are a couple of parts to it. First and foremost, I said, Lord, if, if I have your blessing, Ask Sally to marry me. Then she's an RN and she's a good RN. Wherever I'm appointed to serve, there has to be a hospital within 20 miles. Now that may not seem like much to you, but that's not always the case with some of the appointments in East Ohio. And I didn't want her to sacrifice her vocation in order to marry me. So Sometime later, I received a call that I was to drive up over the weekend to meet with a superintendent up in Norwalk, Ohio, on a given Saturday to be taken in. How's that for a phrase? To be taken in to the interview. The DS had me eating for breakfast. He shared a brief overview of the church, and then he drove me to the interview. I got in his car, and as we drove through Norwalk and out the south, we passed Fisher Titus Memorial Hospital. And I saw the hospital, and I glanced at his odometer, and I noted the miles. When we pulled into the church, I made the point to look at his odometer again, and I realized it was about 18.7 miles from the edge of the Norwalk to the hospital to that little church in Greenwich, Ohio. And I figured God was cutting things a little close, but. I didn't have much time to think about it because I had to go in an interview with the SBR from these two churches, the two-point church. I don't remember a great deal about the interview. It was, after all, 33 years ago, other than the fact one of the SBR members asking, are you a Christian? I assured her I was. But afterwards, the DS and I got back into his car to head back to Norwalk. But instead of heading north to Norwalk, he drove directly west. I couldn't figure out why. Well, maybe he knows a shortcut or something. But he drove straight west to Willard, Ohio, where he pulled into the parking lot of the Willard Hospital. And I said, why are we here? 
And he looked at me and said, well, if you're going to be living and serving in Greenwich, I thought you would want to know where the nearest hospital is. This hospital is only 11 miles from where you'll be living. And I sat there stunned for a minute, and then I started laughing. And then he kind of looked at me with a puzzled face and said, are you all right? And I said, I'm, I'm fine, but I probably need to share something with you. And I explained to him about the fleece I laid before God and how his actions had just answered part of that prayer. Now, folks, if we're talking about how we got here to this place and where we are today, I have to tell you, that's just one particular fork in the road of the path that God has led me along to bring me to this place today. There are a number of other times and places where God has helped to direct my steps, to guide my paths, oftentimes in far less dramatic ways, and sometimes, in a few incidences, ways that left no room for doubt that it was He who was leading. As I said, we've been talking about being rooted and built up in Christ, and we've talked about uh, where did we come from, and whose child are we, and who loves me, and why. Today, I want us to consider the journeys and path and roads and lanes that we have traveled in order to end up where we are and who we are today. And for my story, I look and say, how on earth did I get from the little town of Randolph, Ohio, where I grew up, to Wilmore, Kentucky, where I went, went to college and seminary and met Sally, to Greenwich, Ohio, my first appointment as pastor. By the way, Sally would get a job at Fisher Titus Hospital in the maternity unit. And while working there, she contracted pregnancy. <laughs> Not once, but three times. And all three of our children were born at that hospital. From Greenwich to Orangeville, Ohio, my second appointment, which was situated right smack on the Ohio Pennsylvania line, the parsonage was on, in Ohio. The, the church was in Pennsylvania, the state line went down the middle of the road. To Bel Air, Ohio. You may have heard of Bel Air. That's home of a football team whose shirts, I was told, were not allowed to wear in St. Clairsville. <laughs> to Millersburg, Ohio, the heart of Amish country. To St. Clairsville, Ohio. And the Thoburn Methodist Church family. Looking back, it's a long story. There's lots of twists and turns and unexpected forks in the roads, some detours, some of my own doing. There are choices and decisions that were made that impacted my direction. There were circumstances and situations that helped to shape and guide the paths I would follow. Now, I could simply say, I chose what college to go to and I chose what seminary and since then, various bishops have chosen where I would go and where I would serve. But, looking back, I have a sense that repeatedly, God has been at work, sometimes in obvious ways, oftentimes behind the scenes, subtly, sometimes blatantly, guiding, directing, encouraging, leading, and nudging to get me to where He wanted me to be. And I would be safe in saying, I think the same is true for you. God's been at work, and is still at work. Now, I don't mean that to believe that everything that's happened in my life has happened perfectly according to God's plan. After all, He created us with something called free will, which simply means we are capable of making choices, both good and bad. Even so, in Romans 8.28, we are assured that we know in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Now, it doesn't say God causes all things, but it says He can work in all things. God can work through our good choices. And somehow, amazingly enough, God can even bring about good in spite of our bad choices. I can remember as a child uh, watching the Coyote and the Roadrunner. Does that ring a bell for anyone? I'll be younger generations going, you have no idea. You know that the Coyote constantly trying to catch the Roadrunner to make it a meal, and 
The roadrunner just seeming oblivious, and no matter what the coyote does, no matter what efforts it makes, no matter how extreme, no matter how well thought of, no matter what it does to try to capture and destroy this creature with a small teeny, the roadrunner is able to turn things around and escape to freedom. I mention that image because that's often the image I have of our father and the dealings with the adversary. Because I believe that no matter what efforts the adversary makes in our lives to try to lead us astray, to trip us up, to tangle us in wrong choices, God looks at it, maybe he doesn't go me, but he says, I can still use that. I can use what was meant for harm and make it good. I could use what he hoped would destroy and turn it around and bring hope and life from it. God can work through our good choices and somehow, amazingly enough, He can bring about good in spite of our bad choices. That's not to say that our choices don't matter. They very much do. One of the pains as a pastor that you often experience is dealing with people who are coming in, dealing with the consequences and repercussions of bad choices that they've made. And you can't just wave a wand and make them go away. But God's able to bring good even from the ashes. The path of least resistance for God's perfect plan is simple obedience on our part. Did you hear that? The path of least resistance for God's perfect plan is simple obedience on our part. Years ago, while a student in college, I had the opportunity to sit down with a missionary. His name was Abu Kony. He had served in Irian Jaya jungle, primitive culture, headhunters. And I listened as he shared how God had worked in his life while serving him. And he, he confessed that early on he had been an utter and total failure on the mission field. But over time, God had worked in his heart and life. And he began to experience a fruitful ministry. And I remember him telling me something. He talked about what I would call God's school of learning. And this is how he said it. He said, God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. Plan A is that we simply follow his leading and obey him. That's the ideal. That's the path of the least pain and regret. However, if we're not willing to do that, if we resist the path of obedience, if we fail that course, God has a plan B. God's plan B is that we learn from the mistakes of others. We see what's happened in their lives, we learn from their painful experience, and so we are able to avoid making some of the same mistakes in our lives. God prefers that we learn by obedience, but if not, He seeks we might learn by hearing the stories, witnessing the painful, sometimes tragic experience of others who have made the wrong choices. If we choose to ignore plan B, the path of obedience, and if we pass on plan God's plan B, or plan A, we pass on plan B, learning from the failures and experience of others. Mr. Koenig said, God has a plan C. You won't like plan C. It's hard. It's painful. God would much prefer you go with plan A or plan B. However, if you fail those courses, God will allow you to go through plan C. And plan C involves learning the hard way by our own wrong choices and painful consequences. God would much rather have us learn through the path of obedience, plan A, or plan B from the mistakes of others. But if all else fails, he will allow us to face the difficult experience of plan C. Hopefully, at some point in our lives, we wise up and begin to learn, begin to learn that the best path is plan A. At some point in your journey, you've no doubt heard Jesus' words as recorded in Luke 9, 23. Then he, Jesus, said to them, All, whoever wants to be my disciple must... When I do that, that's your cue. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take the cross daily and follow. 
When you decide to follow Jesus, it's not a one-time thing. It's not simply once and done. Following Jesus calls for a daily devotion and commitment to seeking and obeying God's will for your life. The late United Methodist Bishop Reuben P. Job put it this way. To commit to following Jesus is to commit myself to a lifelong journey of being led where Jesus wants me to go and not necessarily where I want to go. This situation often causes opposition within myself. Jesus may call me to do what I do not normally and easily want to do. Jesus may ask me to wait or remain silent when I wish to speak or move on. In each of these cases, I experience opposition within to what Jesus calls me to do and be. Does that ring a bell with any of you? In the 143rd Psalm, we hear the seemingly simple prayer of the psalmist. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Make your, may your good spirit lead me on level ground. Easy enough, isn't it? Teach me the way. Give me a straight and simple path. But oftentimes, the resistance to following Jesus it may come from external forces and external circumstances, but more often than not, the greater resistance comes from within us, doesn't it? We seek what is easy. We seek what is comfortable. We seek what we would like. What seems to come naturally to us. It doesn't seem much in line with Jesus' call to self-denial and taking up our cross, does it? But for those who make the choice to follow Jesus, God promises to not leave them in the dark. He promises to help direct our steps, to offer guidance and direction. We all could use one of these in our lives, couldn't we? In John 8, it says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, that's not to say following Jesus is easy. We forget that his goal is not our comfort. Take the burst of bubble. His goal is not our comfort. His goal is to transform our hearts and lives. Years ago, in fact, just a little bit under 10 years ago, 10 years ago minus about a month and a half, Sally and I received a call. Actually, it was someone you may recall, Reverend Kim Anderson. Kim was my superintendent at the time. My wife called me as I was coming out of a store on my cell phone. She said, the DS just called. You want to do numbers? Should I be worried? I said, no. I serve on a committee with him. He probably just needs some minutes or something in the meeting. So I called him up and I said, here, it's Tom. So is this that dreaded call every Methodist pastor hates to get? And he went, uh, Tom. I just came out from the cabinet meeting. And I went, oh my gosh, it is. He said, yeah, it is. And we were told that we would be moving. My two sons were getting ready to head up back to college. Our youngest daughter was just about to graduate from high school, looking towards attending Ohio State, or as she would often correct me, THE Ohio State University. That fall, she was going to enjoy her last summer with her friends in that town that wears black and red. We were fairly comfortable where we were. We had not requested to be moved. The church had not desired that we be moved. And I wrestled with the whole idea of moving. I questioned if that was really what God wanted us to do. I questioned how my daughter would deal with graduating and losing her last summer with her friends before heading to college. I questioned a lot of things. 
And I can remember one morning grabbing my devotional book and my Bible and finding a quiet room in the church basement where I could spend some time with God. And I spent some time in prayer, sharing my concerns, my fears, my anxieties, my questions with God. And then I opened the devotional book that I had to the assigned reading for that day. And this is what it said. Genesis 12, 1. And God said to Abraham, Get out of your country. Go from your family and your father's house to a land I will show you. And then these were the words of the devotional writer for that specific day. When God calls us to follow him, he does not tell us what our journey is going to be like. If he did, we might be too terrified to go. He wants our attention on him, not on the way we will travel. He wants us to entrust ourselves to him. God's way for us is seldom what we would have chosen. This is one of the sweet surprises that God has for us. When we trust Him and follow Him along unexpected ways to unexpected places, we find as we look back that the ways and places always fit. We recognize they were just right for us. And he closed with this quote, In Christ, our fears are never justified. But our faith always is. If I had sat down with the author of that devotional book that day and poured out my heart and told him what I was experiencing, he could not have written more appropriate words to help me at that moment. By the way, I stumbled upon this passage and this devotion again just a couple of months ago after I got another call from another guy, many of you know, Reverend Dr. Bradley Call, who was my district superintendent, who called, and uh, many of you know Brad was, had been going through treatment for prostate cancer. He's doing well. He called me one Friday night as Sally was training for a new job, and I got the phone and I saw it was him. I said, so Brad, how are you doing? Wait a minute. Should I ask how I'm doing? And Brad said, yeah, that would probably be more appropriate. So the same devotion kind of came back to me. If we're going to be honest in responding to my opening question, how did I get here? How did you get here? We'd have to say, God led us to this place. Sometimes through difficult paths, sometimes through circumstances, sometimes through the words and encouragements of others, sometimes by closed doors that redirected our paths, sometimes through plan A, sometimes through plan B, sometimes through plan C. For a number of years at several churches where I served, we had a disciple Bible study. Are you familiar with disciple? Uh, it's, it's an intensive 34-week Bible study. And it challenges those who sign up to commit to 34 weekly classes of two and a half hours each, as well as committing to daily Bible readings of about 20 minutes every day of reading and taking notes, and completing a weekly lesson prior to coming to the class. That's a pretty big commitment to sign on. So whenever I had people sign up for me, I'd have an orientation meeting, and we'd sit down in that meeting, and I would kind of go over the format of the class, what it involved, let them know what they were getting into, but I always ask, we went around the room, but I always ask people to share, why are you here? Why are you interested in taking this class? And I received a variety of responses from, I'd like to get to know my Bible better, to so-and-so took the class and recommended it to me, to my wife told me I should do it. <laughs> On a couple of occasions, I can remember someone saying, I have no idea why I signed up for this class. And I can remember smiling and saying, I know why you signed up for this class. You signed up for it because the Holy Spirit wanted you here. You signed up for it because the Holy Spirit gave you a nudge. You're here because I believe God wants you. Now, oftentimes,
times at that point they would kind of look at me and go, hmm? And I think that was confirmed in the course of those class sessions. How did you get here? Not what car did you drive, what route did you take, who gave you a lift. Looking back, thinking of the paths and trails that God has led you down, how did you get to where you are today? Perhaps there were detours of your own choosing. Life itself may have led you to take different paths at times, but through it all, I believe God was calling, reaching out, nudging, directing, in countless ways, seeking to bring you and I to this time and this place. Do you believe that? Or is it all just chance? Remember that passage we opened with? Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those He redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those He gathered from the land, from east and west, from north and south. If you read 107th Psalm, it's really intriguing. It opens with those words. And then it will say, some sat in darkness. And God brought them freedom. Some wandered on distant paths. And God led them in. And it goes down through the psalm, describing different situations and different settings and how God has gathered us in. Friends, I believe God has gathered us together. For a purpose and for a reason. And the good news, the great news is, that the God who has led us this far is not finished with us yet. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Let us pray. Father God, if we are at all spiritually aware, in touch with the Spirit's leading. We can look back and see the times and places and moments and situations and settings where your Spirit has guided our steps. Where you've taken what was broken and brought healing. Where you've brought us out of confusion and clarity. When you've led our paths. When you've worked your transforming touch. Father, it's a long journey for each of us. We come by different paths, different roads. But you've led us here. And you're not done yet. In a few moments, Father, you will seek to lead us from this place. Not simply to send us. Not as if you camp out here and wait to see us again next week. But you go with us. You prepare the way. And for that, we are truly thankful that we can trust an unknown future to a known God. Guide and direct our steps and give us the wisdom and the courage to follow where you lead. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray.